Hello, 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 hello. Yes, I am Quentin Cooper, tweeting as at QWERTY, inside leg measurement 34, waist not far off, but now you know too much about me. You are all doubly, nay, triply welcome to the third FameLab International Trimmy final. Who's been with us since 10 a.m.? Oh, yeah, you fame labbers, you don't really count, but the rest of you, very, very impressive. Now, if you were, you'll remember that right at the start, I said something, I think, quite profound and quite moving, which was, Cheltenham Festivals is a charity. It offers diverse opportunities for 25,000 children and young people and the community through world-class festivals and outreach programs. Have a look at the website to find out more and to get involved. And I've just said it again. And if you go to other events, you'll be hearing that quite a lot. Okay, who was here just for the second Tremmy and came back? That's good, that's good, we like, that's great, great. And who's new? Who's really, really new? Hasn't been to any Fame Lab thing before? Brilliant, one, two. Oh, yeah, oh, and that's one of the judges, that's particularly good as well. <laughs> right, don't be shy, it is always good to have new people here. Think of this as a sort of smorgasbord of talent, only without the board bit, okay? FameLab is well into its second decade. It is the world's largest science communication competition. And the best thing of all for you is you've chosen the best Tremi final to come to. Not necessarily because the FameLabbers are better or worse or anything in this one, but because in the immortal words of De La Soul, three is the magic number. FameLab is all about the number three. So this is the third Tremi final. Uh, and, the, and we start with 27, three cubed, uh, finalists from around the world, they get whittled down to, by our judges to nine, three squared. Uh, they each get three minutes to talk. The judges get three minutes to make up their minds as well. And of course, there are three judges, so it's all about the number three. And then the audience also gets to send through somebody, so it can also sometimes be about the number four as well. But don't, don't listen to that, because that confuses the whole three thing. It doesn't work. And actually, from the first Tremi final, <laughs> the audience sent through somebody different to the judges. The second Tremi final, the audience sent through someone different to the judges. So what I can promise you is for the final, there will be at least 11, if not 12, finalists tomorrow. 12 being at least three times four, so we're vaguely back to the whole three thing. Now, there's probably a few other things you should know, but frankly, I've been here since 10 o'clock this morning. And can I be bothered to explain? Not really. It'll all sort of make sense as it goes along as well and we'll get going as soon as I've introduced our three judges. Can you welcome to the stage, first of all, self-described on Twitter as particle physicist turned science communicator. She's also former deputy director of the Jodrell Bank Discovery Center, former director of the Manchester Science Festival, and most importantly of all, a fame labber from way back in, can I say this, 2007. Please welcome Marika Nanin. Come on up, would you like a hand up? I hope you appreciate the outfit, the outer spacey outfit. She's also got a really silver backpack, which makes her look like an astronaut, but she's not wearing that now. Uh, next, we have somebody with a cetacean citation. He's a postgraduate researcher at the University of Bath, studying phytoplankton morphology and its influence on turbulent interactions. And he's a science communicator and educational consultant at Incredible Oceans, which, as you may know, is the education outreach program for the World Cetacean Alliance. Flap your fins together for Russell Arnott. <laughs> and third and furthest flung is science editor at SASTA, the South African Agency for Science and Technology Advancement, as well as FameLab South Africa project leader, Joanne Riley. <laughs> Come on up. So, Marika. Poacher turned gamekeeper, Fame Lab participant turned Fame Lab judge. How does it feel to be on the other side? I tell you what, Quentin, it feels better being on this side. <laughs> well, because you can pass judgment without actually having to know what this I, is saying. I'm just going to kick back, relax, and enjoy the show. Kick back and relax. I am. It's an interesting attitude to judging. I'm <laughs> glad. It's good. It's very laid back. So, Russell, we've got nine champions, most of whom have come huge distances to be here. What for you, as well as the official criteria of content? clarity, charisma, but what will you be looking out for to make a difference? 
Uh, well, being that they're coming from all over, I'm gonna look for some funky accents. That's what I'm after. Funky accents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the strong, there's a correlation on, on the Russell graph. There's a correlation between strength of accent and probability of going through yeah, to the final. Definitely. You now, you've now guaranteed that however good all their English is, they're gonna come on stage and go, "Hello." I, uh, okay. Anything apart from the slightly ludicrous strength of accent criteria? Um, I'm just, well, I, I have uh, ADHD, so I have a very, very low kind of attention span. So if I just phase out halfway through, I'll know they won't, uh, they're not any good. Right. So, yeah. So Fem Lab is anything a bit long for you, really? You, yeah, yeah. you, you want the sort of 30 second version yeah, of Fem Yeah, just be like, okay. yeah, whatever. Oh, a squirrel kind yeah. of thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, although if there is a squirrel in here, something will have gone really, really badly wrong. Uh, Joanne, tell us briefly what SASTA is. Uh, SASTA is part of our South African government's National Research Foundation and we are focusing on public engagement and we're actually uh, coordinating our government's um, science engagement strategy. So there's a lot of, yeah. And it's obviously, at least bits of it are going well because the current reigning international fame lab champion, a reign which ends in about 28 hours, is Tsiamo from South Africa. So what difference has it made to you or to her being the international champion? Well, it's great to have a champion at home. Um, and she's become involved in a lot of other public engagement activities um, and been invited to other countries and so on. And I hear you did bump into her in Bulgaria. I did, yes. <laughs> she was in Bulgaria. Like we were both at the Bulgarian Science Festival last month, as you yeah. are. Yeah, so she's, I mean, she's enjoyed her year and, and she will continue, as most FameLab alumni do, in some form of public engagement. It's a, Brilliant. Great experience. And anything you'll be particularly looking out for? We've had Russell's dodgy accent criterion. What will you be looking for? What's going to make the difference between a national champion and an international finalist? I'd like to hear something I don't know um, and something that I can say, hey, that makes sense. That's really cool. Uh, so that's, that's kind of my criteria. Um, otherwise, to be reminded of something I do know in a way that makes me think about it differently. Okay. And Marika, when you're not kicking back and relaxing and imagining a cocktail in your hand, what will you actually be looking out for? No, I'll be kicking back, relaxing, but focused. Right. Um, but I'm, I am looking for a really interesting story. Right. You're like the anti-matter version of Russell, aren't you? He's kind of saying he's kind of only focused for a second, but you can really relax I want to relax still focus. and have a nice story, yeah. You're, so you're between matter be and anti-matter yeah. here. I will, I will actually be paying some attention, but I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's fine. You, 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 you've written yourself into a corner, Russell. That's fine by me. OK, it is a really tricky challenge that they've got because these are all national winners. They come through national heats, national finals to be here. So trying to pick three from nine is nigh impossible. But we've had to find three really quite gullible people to do this. So can we give them, please, a huge burst of applause for the triple whammy that is our judges? <laughs> and like I say, for those who just joined us, we'll explain later, but your audience vote will also send somebody through to the final. Whether or not it is the same as the judges, we will find out. And they will then join the finalists already there, who are from Bangladesh, Cyprus, Germany, Malaysia, Portugal, Qatar, Qatar, Spain and the UK. Right, let us get on with it. And the order of the nine is decided in our usual random way, which is the body mass index divided by the ratio of grime to death metal on their phones. Which means first up is also of all our 27 fame labbers, the one who has come furthest, clocking in at over 17,000 kilometers. It is our Aussie champ, Vanessa Pirotta. 17,000 kilometers. That is a vast separation, which is also an anagram of Vanessa Pirotta as is proof a Satanist, although that's harder. Now, what I can prove is she's a PhD student at Macquarie University in Sydney, and having previously been involved in rehabilitating sea turtles, she's now moved into the big leagues and works on whale conservation, including using drones to collect their snot. Blue whale bogey, anyone? She's from New South Wales. She knows truths about whales. Applause for Fame Lab Australia champion, Vanessa Perotta. <laughs> Whoa! Do you ever notice that sometimes when you sneeze, you have a lot of snot and sometimes you don't? Well, did you know that the average adult lung capacity is about six litres, which means our snot-producing capabilities are rather low in comparison to another mammal, such as a whale, which can have a lung capacity of over a thousand litres. In fact, by collecting whale snot, we are able to gather a snapshot of a whale's health 
as this contains information such as DNA, hormones and bacteria. But how exactly do we collect whale snot? Well, I found out that current methods involve being on a boat with a long pole and a petri dish at the end of this, holding this over a whale's blowhole and waiting for them to ugh, breathe. But this can be dangerous, as an 80-ton whale could easily flip a boat and stressful, not only for the whale, but also for the researchers involved. So the question I wanted to ask in my PhD is what is the best non-invasive method for collecting whale snot for an assessment of whale health? In order to do so, I collaborated with drone experts in industry, and together we designed and built a waterproof drone with petri dish for collecting whale snot from northward migrating humpback whales off Sydney, Australia. Once a whale or pod of whales are sighted, we launched a drone from the back of our boat. Then once in position, the petri dish lid would open. Then as a whale took a breath, the drone has flown through the densest part of the whale's snot. Immediately after, the lid was shut securing the sample and minimising contamination as the drone has flown back to the research vessel. Overall, we conducted 74 flights and successfully collected 59 samples of whale snot from at least 48 different whales. We were able to identify different whales based upon the unique colours and scar patterns observed through the drone's camera. I then used forensic techniques to try and identify the types of bacteria living in whale lungs. And interestingly, I found these whales shared similar bacteria with northern hemisphere whales and some dolphins. But I also found out that we can use this information to help monitor the recovery of these magnificent creatures post-whaling. Overall, my research is revolutionising the way in which we collect health information from whales around the world. This method is a much safer and less stressful alternative for both whales and researchers. So the next time you sneeze, or pick your nose, think about how scientists are using drones to collect whale snot for conservation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. That was a different topic. I didn't expect to hear about whale snot today. Thank you. <laughs> um, did you say, or did I maybe miss it, how long you collected those samples over, the 74? We collected, well, we first of all, we trialled the sample or the collection method in one year, and then the year after, we were able to refine our method where we, were, we collected the majority of our samples in just two days. So it was really efficient. Okay. And, and my hope is to collect more samples to learn more about the population over consecutive years. Okay, and so how long do you, would you like to continue the research for? Oh, that's a great question, because I think every researcher would like to continue it forever. <laughs> but it would be more viable, uh, potentially in the next few years, because we don't know the types of bacteria living in whale lungs, and this is a great way to start. This is baseline information. This is what we're asking. What are the types of bacteria likely to be found in, in humpback whales that we consider relatively healthy? Is it possible to catch a cold from a whale? <laughs> well, that's a great question as well, because uh, some follow-on work from this work from my PhD has identified viruses for the first time. We identified six novel viruses in these humpback whales off Sydney. So potentially, yes, which also has implications for people working on animals that may have stranded, in which case we would need to ensure that we have more protection when working around them. One more, or not one more? Um, so I was, I was amazing to hear about you using drones. What other ways did you think about or try that didn't make the grade and made you go with drones? Oh, what, uh, what was I personally interested in or why drones? What other ideas did you have that didn't make the grade? Well, uh, uh, the other options was to collect whale poo. And the only thing is that whales don't often poo all the time. And when they're migrating, they're predominantly feeding in Antarctica. So there's not much whale poo off Sydney. Um, but whale snot, they produce a lot of it. They're breathing because they're air-breathing mammals like you and I. So it was a natural sort of sample to go towards. And it makes it seem much more logical. If you've got a choice of whale poo or whale snot, well, That's whale <laughs> snot is the obvious. OK, thank you for our tip-top whale snot snapshot. Thank you. thank you. From our whales out of Oz, Vanessa Pirotta. Uh, next, we go to Korea, and our sole representative from that part of the world and 2018 FameLab Korea winner is Chan Woo Park. Now, Chan studies genetic engineering, and if that makes you think of scientists meddling with nature and Frankenstein foods and just plain Frankenstein, 
then you're exactly the audience that Chan Wu is after. He thinks a lot of people have prejudice against genetic engineering and without proper knowledge, and he wants to share his experience and expertise and examples, as he puts it, of life science in our everyday life so everyone has a chance to rethink about genetic engineering. I think Chan's chance and yours may be coming up right now. Get ready for a career change from Chan Wu Park. Sickle cell disease is horrible for a horrible disease. I mean, Jack the Ripper and communism. Nothing good ever come with a sickle, right? And it really is as horrible as it sounds. Sickle cell disease, a genetic disorder, turns red blood cells sickle shaped, which are no great carrying auction. No auction, no breeding. Not the breeding, no breeding. Well, what if the secret to stopping this horrid illness can be found in the very moment of our birth? The red blood cells have a, have a key protein called hemoglobin, which is responsible for picking up oxygen. This hemoglobin is made out of four parts. <coughs> One half we call alpha, and the other beta. You and me and mothers and everyone else. Our hemoglobin is alpha, beta chained up together. Alpha, beta chained up together. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alpha, beta, gender, together. Uh, can you give uh, applause? <laughs> Alpha, <laughs> but, uh, but the problem is with this beta gene, which sometimes suffers mutation and makes it all good secret shape. And unfortunately, we do not yet have a fix for beta gene mutation. But here's a surprise. We are actually not born with alpha beta hemoglobin. Hemoglobin in unknown babies, the fetal hemoglobin has the same alpha half as the mother, but for the other half, it's gamma, not beta. And incredibly, this fetal hemoglobin alpha gamma combination within minutes of the baby being born switches to adult hemoglobin alpha beta. It's really like a switch a switch of life from alpha gamma to alpha beta. And so what do we do when we know a baby has a problem with this beta gene? Simple. We stop the switch. We use some chemicals to hold back the switch of life so that the baby, even after it's born, continues to live with alpha gamma hemoglobin, with the troublesome beta gene silenced. Amazing, right? Well, I'm afraid. We are not quite there yet. We know, in theory, it can work, but we have yet to make it work. And along the way, there will be challenges, risks, and surgery controversies. But remember, we are all here today, enjoying all this amazing science, uh, amazing tools of science, because we can breathe. And in finding this switch of life means breathing chance for 4.4 million patients around the world. Well, I think it's damn worth a try. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> cool. Thanks very much. Really enjoyed the use of the fan there. That was a, a good prop. Um, so obviously, you're really a big proponent of uh, genetic engineering. What would you say to someone who was slightly like, really, designer babies or something like that? What would you say to them? Oh, uh, OK, good, perfect. In fact, I have already expected this situation happens. I mean, I don't understand what you're saying because, because I'm making a speech in English today for the first time in my life. <laughs> so, so I have very low level of English ability, just like unborn babies. <laughs> uh, so uh, I might have uh, alpha, gamma, hemoglobin. However, however, I want to talk here about the fact that 
there are so many people who can't do what we do every day, like breathing. And the scientists around the world are working very hard to care of them. But these words, these words are often prejudiced and rejected for no reason. Because of, maybe because of the big barrier between science and public. I think that's the reason why we need more science communicators to become a good science communicator. I'm trying to learn more, and I'm trying to find new communication skills. Oh, of course, including English. <laughs> I just want to see you again, all of you, later uh, at other scientific events or next Cheltenham Festival. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Making his first speech in English and then cleverly making his second speech in English. I'm sure you've left a lot of big fans behind, not just the one you took with you there as well. Very clever way of dealing with not speaking much English. Have a prepared answer. Brilliant. Right, thirdly, in our third Tremi final, we have the continuation of a great Fame Lab tradition, which is the Switzerland winner who is not Swiss. <laughs> Don't know what it is about it. We have is a huge popular competition. Maybe it's because CERN's there and other large research institutes. Maybe it's because the people from abroad are better than the Swiss. Maybe the Swiss don't enter. I don't know. But there is a grand tradition in Switzerland. We've had some brilliant fame labbers, including international fame lab champions from Switzerland. But they're almost never Swiss. And this year, we are, it's, especially with the World Cup taking place, it's nice to have somebody from a nation that is hosting the World Cup but doesn't yet have its own fame lab, which is Russia. And our Swiss-Russian fame lab winner is Dmitry Kopelyansky. After studying at Moscow Medical Academy, Dmitry became fascinated by tropical diseases, as you do. It says it took him two years to finally realize that Russia is really not the kind of place to really be studying tropical diseases because it's not very tropical, which led him to go to slightly more tropical places like Israel, Germany and now Switzerland. I did say slightly. Uh, and now he's here to spread the word, but not the diseases in subtropical Cheltenham. Bring your hands together, then wash them carefully for our Russian Switzerland 2018 Fame Lab winner, Dmitry Kopolyansky. <laughs> Sorry, I, I think I ate something bad. <sighs> Please, uh, help me. <sighs> bad situation, right? Well, imagine this is not only your organism that can swallow something bad sometimes. Some of our cells do it all the time. Why? Well, because bacteria, viruses, <coughs> parasites, all these things can get inside each and every one of you and eat you or poison you. Scary. Luckily, we've got our immune system that protects us. And among many weapons, there is one which is all about eating. Special cells called macrophages. From ancient Greek, macros means big, and phagin means to eat. Macrophage, a big eater, well, just like me. <laughs> the job of a macrophage is to swallow, digest, and destroy different microbes, dead cells, and basically everything which is foreign to us. But sometimes there are things Macrophage really should not swallow. Like Leishmania, a tropical parasite that causes a disease called Leishmaniasis. Look, I only know how to pronounce these things because I study them. <laughs> when Leishmania gets inside our body, macrophage finds it and then it swallows it. But it cannot digest it. Worse than that, Leishmania loves being inside the macrophage. It uses its resources and starts dividing. And then divides and divides and macrophage feels terrible. It releases special molecules, which are the signals for other cells. I, I eat something bad. Please, help me, please. But it's too late. There are so many parasites inside the macrophage, they basically burst it from inside. But the signal is sent already. So all the other macrophages rush there to rescue their colic, and they start swallowing freshly released parasites. And they also get infected. And then it goes on and on and on, and eventually there are so many parasites, they can get inside their liver and spleen, and without proper treatment, that can lead to organ failure and death. Yes, nature, beautiful and horrible at the same time. 
Because we, as humans, develop such a fascinating and complicated immune system to protect us against billions of pathogens. But this Lishmania also evolved and learned. Learned not only how to resist to our immune system, but also how to hijack it and use it as a hotel and a restaurant. <laughs> Luckily, unlike Lishmania, we've also developed intelligence. Well, most of us. <laughs> and with intelligence, we can develop drugs. So when the next time macrophage swallows the parasite, with the right drug, it will be able to digest it, destroy it, and remain big and healthy eater, well, just like me. Thank you, Dimitri. That was um, a really lovely story, as we were just talking about before. I was on the edge of my seat seeing what was going to happen, so uh, thank you. It was I really exciting. Um, what do you do actually yourself? What does your research actually do? So my do? research is exactly about these parasites. And I study, so I used to work with drugs, so search. Actually, what I did before, I was developing an um, automated screening system to search for drugs against the disease. And now I work more um, in underst like towards understanding mechanisms of innate immune response towards this parasite. Thank you. What, um, what defense mechanisms do we have in our body that are effective against the parasite? So you say the macrophi macrophages are not effective? So macrophages are the primary hosts. So that's the thing because their job is to find a pathogen, eat it and destroy. But then Lishmani evolved to survive there and actually benefit from this. Uh, macrophages are the main cells of so-called innate immune response. But they're not, as you can see, so they're not efficient in their job. But then later we have adaptive immune response which kicks in and then that actually protects us. But the problem is there are different types of the disease and in some of them, so the parasites can accumulate in liver and without treatment, it's uh, lethal. But in other kinds, so immune response, adaptive immune response is able to protect us. Okay, so it depends on the parasite? It depends on the parasite, on the geographical region, and most importantly on the immune competence of the host, Thank you. human. Are you worried about getting leishmaniasis because you work with it? Um, uh, yes and no, because I try, as many of you researchers, is to uh, comply with the safety <laughs> rules. Uh, and, um, well, I work with that kind of leishmaniasis, which is luckily not lethal. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there is a, some kind of a danger, but I think a lot of researchers who work with more severe uh, pathogens, like HIV, for example, in, they should be taking more precautions. Okay, all the rage, macrophagia, Russian Swiss champion, Dmitry Kopolyansky. And give us a yell if you're a macrophage in the audience. Really? Oh, well, I'm certainly one, I don't care about anything else, it's fine. Okay, three down, which means so far they're all in the final, but six to go, which means mathematically they're unlikely to stay that way. Uh, I've checked, and next is our Czech champ, Lukas Pekarek. Uh, a master's student at the University of Chemistry and Technology in Prague, Lukas specializes in pharmaceutical biotechnology. He entered Fame Lab because he enjoys explaining scientific topics to his friends. He also enjoys canoeing and last year obtained his water tourism instructor license. Lukas says he's yet to find a way to combine the two, but he is working on it. Here to put the yak into kayak and talk not about the taming of the shrew, but the timing of the virus. Please welcome our can-do canoe Czech champ, Lukas Pekarek. Good evening, dear. <gasps> that you very dangerous dengue virus. Over 400 million people, more than the population of America, are infected annually and there is no cure yet, but I'm working on it. To help all those infected people, I study her, but I don't want to get sick. To tame her, I don't need a, a whip. All I need is science. First, I wear the right protective suit to minimize the risk of infection. Then I sneak up to the virus and steal her genetic information, which is basically a manual for recreating the virus. 
if I then <coughs> extract only the relevant parts, the relevant genes, the gene itself is no longer dangerous, and I can take off my expensive protective suit. I'm safe now. Suppose I want to study how the envelope proteins assemble the whole <coughs> virus. In that case, I use only the gene encoding the envelope protein. And I insert this gene into the E. coli bacterium. After that, <laughs> it is able to produce exactly the same protein in large, enormous, massive quantities. So now I have enough proteins to do whatever experiments I want. With these proteins, I am able to assemble the so-called virus-like particles. These particles have the same structure as those dangerous viruses, but they are not infectious. So this way, I can study different steps in the life cycle of a virus and look for its weaknesses without being worried about the infection. And this simple procedure can be applied to any other virus, like the Zika or the HIV, which in our lab we do. So this is how to tame a virus. Is there currently a vaccine for the dengue uh, virus? Yeah, that was, uh, one was there, uh, but it was, it, there are some problems with it because um, there are several strains of dengue and the vaccine uh, like was effective against only a few of them. So that's like <coughs> um, not really good. Because so do you foresee your work contributing to a new vaccine? Uh, not really, we, okay. we are more um, focus on uh, searching for a drug, for a cure, okay. for acute fear, uh, cure. Uh, so if you got the dengue, you got this cure and you will be like <laughs> safe, Thank I hope. Um, I was wondering, do you ever get stopped going through customs? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Uh, uh, so in the airport, <laughs> in airport security, <laughs> do you ever get stopped uh, traveling yeah, from country uh, to country like with giant <laughs> fake viruses? <laughs> like, uh, fortunately not, but okay. maybe in the back okay. way. Well, you made me forget what I was going to ask now. Um, do, like, people are really scared of viruses. Like, on, on the grand scale, you know, are, are we all going to basically come to an end because the viruses are going to just kill us all? Like, is it, is it a scary thing or do you think we'll be able to beat it? Yeah, I'm working on beating the viruses, so I think uh, we are able to beat them all. But it's like not easy to do it, so I want uh, as many people as, <laughs> as I can encourage to do the same research and help me <laughs> to do this. Try, try and keep it upbeat, Marika. Yeah, are we all going to be killed by viruses? I know. Okay. <laughs> Ready to go viral. Cheering once, cheering twice. Always good to double check. Lukas Pagarak. <laughs> and if there are any long term year on year Fame Lab uh, attendees here, you might remember that it's only a couple of years ago that another Czech. Fame Lab International finalist also had whipping in their in their routine as well. So it's good to see Czech whipping is still maintained. Also, for those who don't know the rules, you're only allowed whatever props you can carry on yourself. But I have never seen somebody come on with a huge suitcase like that <laughs> before. Uh, next, we slalom over 400 kilometers mm -hmm. southeast through Slovakia to Hungary, and our best from Budapest Hungarian champion Agnes Kistov. Now, being called Agnes Kishtov, we should, she should really have gone first because then we would have started with a kiss. Start with the hey kiss, hit for hot chocolate, number five, 1982. Talk about being down with the kids. Uh, now, apologies to Agnes for starting with a bit of wordplay about her name. If I were her, I'd be really kissed off. Uh, Agnes says she was previously bewitched by mathematics, but the enchantment began to wear off during her studies and she discovered another true passion, teaching. Then... The real magic began while teaching maths at university, and she found herself under the irresistible spell of physics. 
So Agnes went back to academia and is now, in her own words, an enthusiastic astrophysics PhD student working with cosmological ionized bubbles. Not just any ionized bubbles, cosmological ionized bubbles. Prepare for a magical mystery tour de force from our Hungarian champion, Agnes Kiss Toff. We can save lives in many ways. Someone just helps an old lady cross the road. Someone becomes a superhero. To investigate complexity science may not seem very heroic at first, but it can be life-saving as well. A complex system can be considered as a compound structure consisting of many parts. For example, the weather or the human brain or a group of people such as a crowd participating at a festival or at a demonstration. And that mass events like these Crowd disasters can happen and can even lead to fatal consequences, although typically nobody intends to cause harm. Conventional explanation tends to blame the participants. Think about the Hillsborough disaster. We say there are see some people who are just rude, and even the nice people can be impatient and push forward. And of course, at some point, panic breaks out and unleashes hell. But the truth is that many crowd disasters do not result from the people's inhuman or irrational behavior. It is caused by the damn thing called physics. <laughs> Examine a moving crowd as a complex system. It's like a river. If everybody has enough personal space, then the river run, runs nicely and peacefully. If, however, more people are crammed into a small space, density rises, then physical contacts, unexpected stoppages occur unintentionally our river is not so relaxed anymore. And if the density reaches a critical limit, then the frequency and the strength of the physical context will inevitably increase. The forces add up and are transmitted from one body to another completely uncontrollably and inescapably. So the flow of the river becomes entirely chaotic. This phenomenon called the crowd turbulence. And if the crowd reaches this phase, there is no turning back. The pushes intensify so rapidly that certainly someone will fall to the ground. This creates a hole where the surrounding people are still pushed from behind, but not anymore from the front. So the hole like vacuum suck them inside, and they are either forced to step on the fallen person, or they will also fall. So what can we learn from this? that there is no need for people to be aggressive or to panic. The crowd turbulence and the black hole effect, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mention, this action is actually the black hole effect. So, because it, if it consumes you, there is no escape from there. And these things actually happen all the time if the density reaches a critical limit. So if you want to prevent these tragedies, we don't need to make people behave, we need to control their density at all times. So if we learn the physics behind, then we realize it's not our enemy anymore. It is actually our superpower. So thank you all. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed that. I like uh, the application of physics and maths. It's always interesting. Um, you mentioned just at the end there about uh, that it's not about people's behavior, but it's more about uh, controlling the density of people. Yes. So obviously at an event like this where you know people from far and wide are flocking to Cheltenham and loads and loads of people are going to be you know at this event how would you control the density of people uh, at an event to control the density first when you organize this kind of event you have to be careful you know to design the place because usually this kind of things happen when uh, the crowd is moving and you have to avoid you know sharp edges on the road or crossing roads or the most dangerous things where the, the bottlenecks when the road suddenly narrows and then the people just, you know, get a bigger density in the inside. So uh, first you have to design the area the way that you probably can avoid these things. After that, during the, you know, an event, you should, uh, as an organizer, monitor the crowd all the time. Uh, monitoring the crowd, it's, uh, it's the better, I think, if uh, uh, it's doing by, you know, people who are watching the, the crowd because then you can, you know, see the physical context, frequency and everything. Uh, but uh, actually in Zurich one time they actually tried an application because it's the 21st century. So with an application they can, you know, monitor 
uh, where are the people, how much people are in different places, and can react because if there was some problem on the way, then they can send a message to the phones, and, um, and there was a two-way you know, communication between the organizers on this. So, but if you want to hear my opinion, uh, during the Hungarian finance, we were in a discussion, and we realized that there is one thing which actually everybody can do to do, you know, to preparing for these things, because uh, this critical density where where this uh, thing happens, uh, it depends on the average diameter of the people. So. The <laughs> only thing we can all do as a community that we eat healthy foods and uh, do sports and get in shape, and then this way we can, you know, reduce our average diameter. <laughs> so that's I my I know invention. You, I, I know you, are you have time for more questions, but I'm afraid you I have to leave them hungry for more. Can we please thank our Hungarian champion, oh, Agnes Kishkov? And Russell, I know you asked about controlling the density of crowds at Cheltenham Science Festival. I need to say officially there are no dense people at the Cheltenham Science <laughs> Festival as well. Uh, next, and coincidentally, also next country alphabetically in Ireland, and their 2018 winner, Sharon Omiwoli. When not being an anagram of, oh no, I am slower, Sharon is following in the footsteps of her doctor father and is studying medicine at University College Dublin. Now, as you might be able to tell from that surname Omiwoli, Sharon isn't originally from the Emerald Isle. She grew up in Canada. While in Ireland, she tries to combine volunteering in the community with generally being a good laugh in order to, as she puts it, live a life of purpose. And what higher purpose can there be? than FameLab. OK, don't answer that. There probably is a higher purpose out there but FameLab. But for now, for the next three minutes, there is no higher purpose than FameLab. The prize at stake is a place in tomorrow's international final. And the person is our 2018 Ireland champion, Sharon Omiwali. Come with me and we'll be in a place of caffeinated coffee. Take a sip. And you'll see. It's bitter. That is bitter. <laughs> Let's talk about coffee. Raise your hand if you love coffee. Now raise your hand if you love tea more than coffee. Eh, wrong answer. That was a test. You're supposed to say coffee. <laughs> Statistics have shown that three in five people drink a cup of coffee to start their day. And Mr. Willy Wonka, a candy inventing genius, is one of those people. Check this. Wonka goes to Starbucks and overhears the person in front of him place an order. <clears throat> Can I get an iced half-calf ristretto, not one, not two, not three, but four pumps, sugar-free, cinnamon, dulce, soy, skinny, la-la, latte. Get all that? Nope. And neither did Wonka. So when it's Wonka's turn, he's going to order a simple coffee because he's a simple lad. But just what is it that makes coffee man's best friend? What's the secret ingredient? Well, since you asked, inside of coffee is a stimulant called caffeine, which tricks your brain into thinking you're not tired. So when your brain says sleep, Caffeine says, no, no. You see, our bodies produce a chemical called adenosine, which binds to receptors in the brain and slows down brain activity, thus making us feel sleepy. But due to having a similar structure, when caffeine's in town, it impersonates adenosine and binds to the receptor instead. So instead of being calmed, your brain gets triggered, which causes the nerve cells to speed up. And your pituitary gland, which produces hormones, senses this, starts freaking out, and signals hormones left, right, and center to release adrenaline, the fight or flight response. On the count of three, I need everyone to put their hands up and say, yeah! One, two, three. Yeah! yeah! That is exactly what adrenaline says. Adrenaline comes to spice up your life by making your pupils dilate, your heart beat faster, your blood pressure increase, and your blood vessels constrict. All these symptoms are indicators that you've been hit by, you've been struck by smooth adrenaline. <laughs> adrenaline also affects dopamine levels by preventing it from getting reabsorbed by the brain, which just means you'll feel good. The sun will be shining, the angels are singing, and you'll just feel so happy. Ironically, this is actually the same thing cocaine does, but not to the same extent. <laughs> Question, will drinking coffee kill you? It's impossibly possible. The lethal dose of caffeine is 150 milligrams per kg of your body. So depending on your weight, disclaimer, don't try this at home, you would need to consume between six and seven grams of caffeine, which would be like drinking 50 or more cups of coffee in a day, which is essentially impossible to do because your body can't take that. 
Ain't that right, Wonka? Wonka over here is still in his first cup. He's not going for the 50. On average, he drinks one to three cups a day. Keeps him feeling alert and energized. Without coffee, he'd feel anxious, grumpy, and turn into an Oompa Loompa. Oh, would you look at that? I gotta go. It's coffee time. Thank you, Sharon. So that was really interesting. And um, I've had many a night lying awake after I've drank too much coffee. So uh, that was a great story. What, what was the point of you picking that topic? What, what did you want us to take home from that? Is that part of your research? What's the take home message? I actually don't drink coffee. <laughs> so, it's just <laughs> so it's actually just from like my observations of like friends and classmates and how they love coffee, but I didn't really know what it was. So I wanted to learn more about it and share what I learned with other people. And some really cool things that I learned about it while I was researching it was that it goes more than just being a drink that people love. It also has a social and a cultural aspect to it. A social aspect in the sense that you can have a good chat with your coworkers, with your friends over a cup of coffee, and cultural in the sense that if you take a look at Ethiopia, this is where coffee is said to have originated from. And there's even like a little story that goes along to it. And how it starts is that there was an Ethiopian uh, goat herder, and he noticed that his goats would, after they ate um, a piece of this berry, they would start acting a little weird. So he tried to eat some of it for himself, and he noticed that he would have the same effects. So then he took it to the monks, but they didn't want it at all. So they threw it into the fire, and it released this smell. And then they're like, hey, maybe there's something good about this. And so now in Ethiopia, it has such a huge significance and it's been being used in um, um, religious, um, religious ceremonies. Why, why do we respond differently to coffee? How, some people can drink 10 cups and still sleep at night and some people can drink one cup and not not sleep at all. So what is, how do, why do we respond so differently? So coffee works, diff everyone has, is going to have a different experience with coffee and this can be due to tolerance. So by tolerance I mean picture there's an athlete, uh, a runner, and he's training to run a marathon. So if he practices each and every single day by taking another meter, eventually he's going to be able to run the marathon without having any problems because he's trained it. So if you train yourself by drinking more coffee each each day, you'll eventually build up a tolerance where you can drink so much and it won't affect you. Whereas maybe if someone who isn't too good with ca taking caffeine, if they tried to take like four cups in a day, they might not respond too well and might end up feeling nauseous and sick. Okay, espresso your appreciation for Sharon Omiwoli. Sharon is already, of course, the champion of a caffeination, but is that enough? Does she have the beans to make it to the final? We will find out soon enough. Only three to go. Now, our magnificent seventh is from Italy. And oddly, if you put all the 27 countries from this year's international final in alphabetical order, you get exactly the sequence we've just had. Hungary, Ireland, Italy. If there's a mathematician in the audience, and this being the Cheltenham Science Festival, I'd be deeply disappointed if there isn't. I'd really like it if you could come to me and give me what the odds are of that happening. Those three in order from all 27 countries. Um, anyway, until that happens, at odds of, let's just say, 11,406 to 1, next we have Italy, and the Italian champion for 2018 is Riccardo Impavido. Uh, originally from Turin, Riccardo is barely out of his teens, first-year physics students at the nearly thousand-year-old University of Padua, which, by the way, counts Copernicus, Vesalius and William Harvey amongst its former students. Being so young in an establishment so ancient seems to have inspired Ricardo not only to develop his fondness for mathematics, but also for philosophy, for the sciences, for cooking, for sports and for origami. He also says he likes talking to people about interesting things and he loves seeing them interested when he speaks. Would you like a demonstration? You're going to get one now. Pad your hands together. So I'll try that again. Pad your hands together for Fame Lab's reigning Italian champion, Riccardo Impavido. Oh, this moment 
This little moment is magic for me. Do you like it? But how long was it? I mean, for me, it felt, trust me, pretty long. Maybe for you, it felt shorter. For my watch, it was 10 seconds, and that's strange. It looks like the time our brains perceive and the time our clocks measure are not the same thing at all. It's strange, but it's true. And it's true because clocks don't tell time. A clock knows nothing about time. A clock just moves its hand whenever a pendulum oscillates. We know about time. We read the clock and tell the time. Now, what if time only existed in our head? What if time was just a concept? What if time was not a fundamental property of nature? What if time did not exist? Well, this equation belongs to quantum loop gravity, a modern theory of physics. It describes the behavior of variable at a really tiny scale, and it does so with a peculiarity, without time. It just tells how a variable moves compared to another, a an hand and a pendulum. But then our idea of time, that arrow always pointed towards the future, where does it come from? Well, in some sense, again, from a cup of coffee, um, scusate, macchiato. <laughs> I pour the milk, I stir with a spoon. Of course, milk and coffee mixes. It'd be really strange if this didn't happen. Imagine an external observer watching milk and coffee that, separate, that separates as I stir with a spoon could argue they're watching a video backwards. But what happens if my coffee is short? With short, I mean really short. What happens if in the cup there are just two particles, one of milk, one of coffee? Then even stir with a spoon and nothing mixes with nothing. The observer can tell in which direction they're watching the video. So if we look at nature close enough, if the coffee is short enough, if we look at the fundamental nature, we don't need time to describe it. But when we are distant, when we do not distinguish the single particles anymore, the world becomes complex and time emerges from this complexity and flows in the direction in which milk and coffee mixes. We are complex beings. We drink from cups where you can make a latte easily. We live in time. So thank you for your time. Thank you. That was a very thought-provoking <laughs> talk. Um, I mean, I think uh, physics, it makes us really question the very fundamentals of um, the world. Um, so you've really yeah, posed a number of questions to us. What do you think about time? What, and well, I, think, uh, I think my microphone, okay. Uh, <laughs> I think that physics uh, follows, you know, positivism. So you can't really argue what's there for real. You just can make up a theory and see if it works. And apparently, this theory works better without time. So, yes, time at a fundamental level might not exist. With fundamental level, I mean 10 to the minus 35 meters, which means that if an atom was as big as an apple, then, uh, um, pardon, uh, the nucleus of an atom was as big as an apple, then if it would expand this nucleus of an atom as big as the galaxy, the 10 to the, f the, 10 to the minus 35 distance would be as big as the apple. So we're really deep. But there it might not, it might not exist. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously um, we, we do travel through time in that we go forward through it. Do you think it would be possible for us to ever invent a time machine? No. Good work. I, I think <laughs> no. Uh, I think we, as uh, complex beings, I mean, we might travel back in time, but there is one chance in a lot. And with a lot, I mean, imagine a number as big as you can, and it's way bigger than that. <laughs> because uh, it's really, really unlikely. We're talking about the arrow of time. I mean, things mix because it's the mixed state is the most likely to happen. And we call it time, but just probability. Okay. 
OK, time's up, or maybe not, <laughs> for Ricardo Imparvino. Thank you. The, one of the arguments, of course, about time travel is if somebody invents a time machine next year or in the next decade or the next century or any point, then why haven't we seen it? Because it can happen any time if they invent a time machine. So where is the time machine? We've got the entire history of humankind to make it or something else. It seemed that Ricardo might have done that. Yeah. Or, yeah. Well, maybe he has because we could be f living time backwards now, yeah. in which case we're going to start the whole of Fame Lab again. So welcome to... Oh, no, no, let's not do that. Let's not do that as well. By the way, uh, my Italian is a little bit rusty, but I believe imparvido uh, means fearless or intrepid, which is a fantastic name for a Fame Labber. Uh, next to the Netherlands and their 2018 winner, uh, Jai Santana. Uh, Jai is part academic, part crime fighter, which sounds like a pitch for a TV cop show. And actually, the detail still sounds like a pitch for a TV cop show. By day, he's an assistant professor at the University of Twente in the East Netherlands. By night, he works with the Dutch police, banks and others to help solve and prevent cyber attacks. And sometimes, he does it the other way round. That's the kind of maverick academic crime fighter he is. Even back during his PhD, some of Jai's ideas and methodologies were adopted by network operators and the Dutch high-tech crime unit, and he acted as a technical advisor to the country's National Cyber Security Centre. It all fits with Jai being, as he says, an ambitious cybersecurity professional, but also somebody who loves spreading his knowledge in a very engaging way. Here on stage and ready to engage and to go beyond engagement to the next stage, our Dutch champion, Jai Santana. I don't know if you noticed what Quentin Finnish say. But let me explain. Friday will be my marriage. And then actually, I brought the bride, just in case. But also, I brought my mother over there. When she arrives here and I said, I go to Fame Lab, she said, no, no, too irresponsible. My sister at her side, also from Brazil, said, are you crazy? But my fiance said, do it. And the reason? It's three, Quentin. One is because I love science communication. The second one is because I always very organized and know what is a plan A and B. And the third one is because I'm D1 Dutch specialist in distributed denial of service attack, for short, DDoS. Huh? Yeah, let me explain, of course. But first, DDoS attack is like a hacker that has thousands of machines. And what he does is send a storm of data against a service. The conclusion is that you will not be able to access the website that you most like. You will also not be able to access Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Well, not be nice. But back to my wedding. If you would be in my situation, what would you do? Let me tell you what I will do. I wake up, plan B, plan A. And the plan A is wake up early, get the car, drive to Birmingham, and get the cheapest flight that I read booked. You know I'm saving for the wedding. But then comes plan B because I arrived there and was a huge storm. My plan B is just to buy right away a big company flight that then I can fly to the Netherlands. But wait. Perhaps Birmingham will be closed because of the storm. Then I have plan C. And the plan C is to go to Heathrow because a big airport likely will not close. But then I still have plan D here. Let's go by car. So then if nothing, nothing works, I go and drive 10 hours by car. And what is this about DDoS attack? Well, if you are hit by a storm of DDoS, what do you do? Plan A, you just keep with your infrastructure. Plan B, you call British Telecom and ask them to shut down the attack. Plan C, you just hire a big computer cybersecurity company. And plan D, you ride around the attack. And this, now you know how to solve DDoS attack. And sweetheart, I will be there. I promise.
Cool. I was supposed to come up with a question, but I was just like, what? Like, completely <laughs> fascinated, that, which, is, which is really amazing. Um, cool. I really liked the analogy there. That was, uh, that was very interesting. Um, how many cyber attacks do you think you've helped prevent? Uh, very good question. Yeah. So, since the last year, I started working with the Cyber Dutch Police. Cool name. Yeah. And from that moment, we stopped all the attacks against the Dutch government. It means a little bit more than 2,000. Please. Is it like um, CSI in 24? Yes, it is. <laughs> imagine that you are, that I it is, it is. is and it? imagine that you are like a, a, a PhD <laughs> and you are paid to hack each other. And the way that I measure the attackers is that I provoke them, they attack me, and then I measure everything and then they discover everything that they are doing. Cool. Yeah, super nice. <laughs> How much time do you have between plan A, B, C, D, or is it all happening together to prevent It's written an there, yeah. So okay. the point is I decide to wake up at 3 in the morning because it's one hour to Birmingham. And then it's one and a half, uh, in the same airport, plan B, yeah, uh -huh. big flight. But then if at 3 in the morning when I wake up and they checked, I still have two hours to arrive in Heathrow. Okay. Actually, it's 1 and 45 minutes, and then I can make the other flight. But then, what is the German uh, competitor? There, he offered me a car ride because he came riding from Germany. <laughs> All self, <Thank> sweetheart. <laughs> okay, and I have a quick question. Deep down, secretly, are you hoping that you will make the final or that you won't because that will give you an extra day? And do you know what your bride-to-be is thinking on the answer to that question? Priscilla, can I stay? Please. Okay, can we thank Jay Santana? And I didn't explain at the start, but I think it became clear he's from Brazil, but lives in the Netherlands. And yes, he really is getting married on Friday. Uh, eight down, one to go, and the remainder is Romania. And we've gone and saved the Bucharest to last. Uh, our FameLab Romania champion is Michna Ioan Nicolescu, uh, which is an anagram of heinous, comical, inane, which is at least two-thirds untrue. Uh, Michna originally trained as a surgeon. I mean, not originally, 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 obviously he was a baby, but I mean, when first, you know, you know what I mean, anyway, fine. Uh, but his real first love is teaching. He now runs the first Romanian module of rege regenerative dentistry. He teaches dental students about cells, tissues, uh, regenerative dentistry, and he says sometimes about coffee and board games too, but coffee is becoming a bit of a sub-theme here. Uh, improving their dental skills and their mental skills by this cunning double act. No idea which he's going to focus on in the next three minutes, but open wide and brace yourselves for Romania's reigning champion, Michna Jörn Nicolescu. <laughs> Thank you. I want to share a knowledge with you today about a tooth, but not about any tooth, but about a particular one, better known by its stage name, the wisdom tooth. Once, it is your only organ that is younger than you. Why? Because it starts forming eight or nine years after you were born. And secondly, because it has something very special inside. Yes, I said inside, because teeth are not just hard structures that help us chew with. They also have a soft part inside, the pulp, with nerves, blood vessels, and many other cells. And among those cells, there are some very special ones, which can transform into many other types of cells, the stem cells. Of course, many of our organs do have stem cells. They are there to help those organs heal, grow, and repair. Let's give you an example. We all know those photos with small children with their beautiful smile and their tiny little hands reaching into the air. And take a look at your hands now. How do you think they became like this? Step by step, new cells replaced old cells and adding, building up to the size and shape of your hand today. Okay, so many organs have stem cells. Teeth have stem cells. What's so special about wisdom teeth? It's because they are younger, they haven't been subjected to what? To stress? to chemical attacks by acids, or to physical temperatures, extreme temperatures. That means their cells are more prone to transform into something else. 
And I hope now you will understand why the wisdom in wisdom is. So, the important part, the most important part of my talk is getting you to realize that from these cells, we can get something else completely other than teeth. By harvesting them and growing them into certain conditions and environment, they may turn into bone cells, into muscle cells, or nerve cells. Of course, most of these experiments are still in lab phase, but once their scientific hypothesis is demonstrated and their amazing potential is confirmed, the transition from test tube to patient is set to happen in a more near or distant future. I hope now all of you, when facing the question what to do with your wisdom tooth, would think twice when removing them and ignoring the knowledge in their stem cells. I would like to thank you all for your attention, and uh, I hope all of these cells will help us repair our teeth and other organs in need, and I wish all of you to be as wise as the wisdom tooth. Thank you. Thank you, that was amazing. So um, they're still in the lab phase at the moment, and when, I mean, when do you think you might be able to start using this stuff, and what, what applications do you think it'll have straight away? I said some of them are in the lab phase because some of them are already in uh, human, uh, not trials, but already in human clinics. For okay. example, uh, some oral stem cells have been developed into uh, cornea, so that's the anterior transparent portion of yeah. the eye. Yeah. And uh, in Japan, it's already in, in progress, so people with corneal defects are repaired with using their own stem cells from the mouth, and they can see again. Amazing, thank yeah. you. So you saying you suggesting we keep our wisdom teeth and not take them out, but could we take them out and store them effectively in some way to be used in the future? What's the uh, actually you, you, of that? you sorry? No, no. <laughs> yeah, actually, you take the, the wisdom tooth out, and then uh, instead of just uh, removing it, you, you extract the stem cells inside them, and you can store them in bank cell banks like like you do with umbilical cord cells. Okay. Thank you. I think it's interesting that people are like, oh, you know, wisdom teeth are redundant, therefore where we used to eat grass, and now we found another use for them. So I think that's, uh, yeah, I'm totally going to keep mine. Thank you. <laughs> you too, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I'd Thank like you. To know more. <laughs> I'd like to know more about when Russell used to eat grass, but that's a story for another day. But can we, again, please thank for his tooth truths and incisive <laughs> incisor wisdom, our Bulgarian finalist, Mekna Erin Nikolescu. And don't be down in the mouth, but that was the last of all 27 of our fame labbers. So can we please have another round of applause for all nine of the ones in this Tremi final? <laughs> and just bask in the warm glow of this last moment before the judges separate them into finalists and also rands. It's one little collective for now, but that is destined to end. So since 10 o'clock this morning, we have had three cubed 27 fame lovers from three cubed countries, still 27, but only room for three squared, nine to be sent through by our judges. Judges, you have three, not squared, but just three minutes to go and make your minds up. So please be escorted away that away. Can we send them on their way with a big round of applause, please? Because it's a really tough task <laughs> choosing three from nine. And while they are selecting, you are going to be electing one of the nine who will be there. Now, for those who've just joined us, the way it works, if the audience vote is the same as what the judges have chosen, that's just the way it goes. If it's different, it's an extra one. So far, and don't treat this as a challenge, each time the audience vote winner has not been one of the judges three. So we've already got eight people through to the final. And whatever happens, there will be at least 11 finalists tomorrow. So if you've got tickets for the grand final, you've got added value. And if you've got, you know, lives, you've got less time to lead them. But that's just the way it goes. So what we're going to do, I've been asked by the audience to help you with the voting this time. Rather than just getting you to vote, there's a special request. Can we get all nine fame labbers up on stage first? Because apparently a bit of visual recognition would basically help. So if you are willing, can we go and round up with a big burst of applause? Can we get up in this order? Australia champion, Vanessa Perotta, Fame Lab Korea 28 champion, Chan Woo Park. Russia, Switzerland, the 2018 champion, Dmitry Kopiliansky. Keep moving along. 
reigning Czech champ Lukas Kulé. All the best from Budapest, Agnes Kistoff. 2018 Ireland victor Sharon Omiwoli. Peerless, fearless Italian winner Ricardo Impavido. Our Brazilian Dutch soon to be married Jais Santana. And Romanian champion Michna Johan Nicolescu. Okay, I'm feeling confident. I'm going to say, let's please welcome back our judges, Joanne Riley, Marika Navid, and Russell Arnott. In the very nick of time. There's only so long you can make these poor nine people stand on stage. Okay? You're all shuffling around. It doesn't really matter which seats you're in. It's all fine for now. Okay, so I know only a tiny amount of time, really difficult, nine people. How on earth have you, without revealing the answers yet, how have you achieved the impossible? Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's all just happened so quickly. Yep. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we had a quick discussion. We had some consensus on, you know, what stood out for us. And, um, yeah, we actually... Yeah, kind of came to a conclusion relatively okay. quickly. Okay, so you're, yeah. you're, you're happy, you're happy, it's yeah, legally binding, it's all fine. Now, obviously, we, we know happy. the rules, you cannot read out. There is no hierarchy here, the three are all equal, but due to the linear nature of time, or is it, <laughs> then you can only do one in a row. So uh, give us some names and step okay. forward when your name Better is called out. i wrong now. <laughs> okay, um, we have Vanessa Pirata from Australia. Woo! <laughs> That's good on a mileage basis, if nothing else. <laughs> that's fine, yeah? Uh, Dmitry Kopolyansky from yeah. Switzerland. <laughs> oh, now this is the really tough. Which one? Which one's it going to be? <laughs> I have no idea. And uh, Agnes Kistot from Hungary. Wow. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Now. Will there be one more to join them, or will there not? Now remember, law of averages is not this. It's worked out so far, but don't get your hopes up, okay? The probability of going through now is vanishingly small, <laughs> okay? The audience vote winner, once again, is not one of the three. So one more of you is going through, and last shall be first. It is Michna, Johan, Nikolescu. <laughs> wow. That is fat. Now, I don't know what that says, but that means it's like, you know, the popular vote and the judges are completely out of whack. It's like America, it's gone, gone, gone crazy as well. So can we one more time, can we first of all please thank our brilliant trio of judges who did have a really impossible task, so we really appreciate what they've had to do today. Uh, Joanne Riley, Russell Arnott, Marika Navin. <laughs> to all of the, fa the nine Fame Labbers gathered here for this Tremi final, And of course, to the four in particular who'll be going through uh, to the final. Uh, I'd also like a yell if you've energy, energy left for, for everyone in the audience who's been here for the whole eight hour marathon. You deserve a round of applause. Don't clap yourselves, get the clap you.